During the 70s, teenagers of different races tended not to mix. Their cultures, music and clubs were mostly separate. But a group of black and white kids, living mainly in suburbia in the home counties, discovered American soul music. They became known as the Soul Boys. From the very beginning, the crowds were mixed and the music, fashion and lifestyle appealed to both cultures. The music blended fast danceable beats with brass sections and jazzy bass lines. In the small sweaty pubs and clubs in Essex, Kent and London's East End, DJs like Greg Edwards, Troggy and Chris Hill started spinning and mixing records to enthusiastic audiences. From underground beginnings as an alternative to the punk era, the Soul Boys scene snowballed to such an extent that entire holiday camps would be taken over for bank holiday weekends by thousands of fun-loving funketeers. We'd been down the King's Road to buy our fashionable trousers for the privilege of going along to that particular caster. And on the very first night, in the very first ten minutes in the main hall, I was covered in water and shaving foam and these very expensive trousers were knackered for the entire weekend and uh, we got into what became the entire case of uniform which would, might be called sports casual which would be t-shirts, appallingly shiny shorts, trainers and white fluffy socks. Soulful music, jazz influenced music, it's just that's, that's been the love of my life, that's, that's just what I was attracted to, I couldn't help it, it just happens, go. <laughs> music with soul. This was music that just made you do that, made you shake by being so beautiful and profound and yet wouldn't making you want to dance. It had everything. That's what soul music is. The first British DJ to actively encourage mixed race dance floors is the originator of the soul boy scene, Chris Hill. Chris Hills was the, the godfather of it all. We talk about the, the soul crowd as a family, and uh, for some reason he got called the godfather. I think his name is well and truly sort of up there as a ledger, no two ways about it. I think I was in the right place at the right time and allowed to do what I wanted to do. I, I had the freedom to do what I wanted to do. I wasn't worried about getting fired from the club or anything if I played the wrong music. I I got in touch with a pub near me called the Orsic Cop and asked him if I could run some parties from there. This was in like 66. And I really, it really kicked it off for me because it, it became very, very successful. We started doing these private parties and then we just opened every Friday and Sunday. And it was ran with people that were coming to hear this weird mixture of records that I was playing. Soul music in general brought so many uh, different uh, groups of people together. It didn't matter about um, age, colour, race, anything else really. It was just. Um, Everybody seemed to, or so many people seemed to identify with it in one form or the other. Anyone here from Essex? I can't see you. Anyone here from Essex? A lot of soul music's very working class, if you like, lyrics and very real. And I think that's the thing. And it's feel good. I think it's feel good music that probably, if you do associate with working class, it's, um, it's weekend music to start off with. People look forward to the weekend, and soul music's very got a feel good attitude to it. There's an obvious, I think, if you look at it, link between the British white working classes and black American music. In fact, we preserved it when they forgot it. I just thought it was great. Working class kids from southern suburban areas had this connection with a bunch of black musicians living in Detroit. I think that the fact that these were mostly working class kids even if they were suburban as, a, as opposed to urban kids, they were still working class. They came from housing estates all over Essex and Kent. The biggest buzz that we ever had in our career was a song that we wrote while we were actually struggling and while we were actually out there on the streets. Early 70s, Children of the Ghetto uh, has become a sort of like an internationally recorded and accepted song. And a lot of artists who we sort of like revere and sort of admire have recorded with people like Courtney Pine, jazz saxophonist, uh, Philip Bailey, lead singer of Earth, Wind and Fire. That has been a tremendous sort of like uh, buzz for us, you know.
One of the best known British soul DJs is Robbie Vincent, whose pioneering BBC radio show in the 70s introduced new soul and jazz funk records to his audience. I often get asked about the makeup of the soul boys and soul girls, and I always say, well, um, whether they be working class or, or middle class, they still had to be fairly bright to be able to find the sort of places that we played at. I mean, if you were a pop fan, you just went down the high street and there would be a club uh, catering for you. But to find the sort of music that we were playing, you had to be part of a network and you had to be able to get there because it very often was not at the end of a railway route. You had to walk, cycle, thumb a lift, drive, get together, that sort of thing. And I've often heard it said it was a predominantly at first white middle class suburban thing. And I think there is an element of truth in that. But I think one of the most important things about it, it was one of the really early uh, examples where the black white thing very much came together. Let's see your hands up in the air! And most club owners didn't want black people in their clubs. And there was a huge problem in the South. I mean, the North never had it, because the North, there were never that many black kids went to Northern Soul clubs. But in the South, what I was doing was actually directly appealing to black kids as well. And I had to work with quite sympathetic club owners to allow myself to do what I wanted to do. And I got my usual bout of hate mail and what have you, because I was encouraging these black boys into, into the area, you know, it was complete bollocks. To me, it was the mark of my success. If I saw a room of like 30% black kids, I thought, blimey, I've cracked it here. This is exactly what I wanted. The scene back then was very, very integrated. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought it was very healthy on that score. And that's probably one of the things I regret most about, you know, what sort of happened post the sort of rave culture acid house culture that 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 didn't we didn't sort of didn't retain that you know through the 90s um, you know not that there was a mass trouble a massive trouble or anything it's just people sort of seem to drift their, their separate ways but that's that's you know that was just evolution of the, the way dance culture went and the way the music constantly sort of split into different avenues the soulfulness of the music meant got you the integration of the different types of people it wasn't just black and white but it was big big asian interest as well you know, the disco records of the day had a massive soulful influence the jazz records had a massive soulful influence the jazz funk records or whatever and it was just it was just it all sat next to each other really comfortably and that isn't as easy today a lot of the other youth cultures that have occurred in this country for some reason or other, and I don't know why particularly, um, violence has always been the edge of it because I guess there was reaction to other cultures as well. The interesting thing about the way the soul boy thing worked is that there was a very deliberate policy of not being violent. Um, it's not like you were dealing with a bunch of people that couldn't deal with the situation if required. And to be honest with you, given the fact that you had a bunch of fellas in strange haircuts, ridiculous shirts, impossible trousers and uh, crazy shoes. There's plenty of opportunities for other people to decide that they were worth picking on. Didn't happen. These were grown up men who had made a very conscious decision that we were not going to have that as part of our scene. We were a multiracial group of people, uh, so there wasn't that angst to deal with in the first place. And then after that, it was just simply, we're here to have fun and fun doesn't involve violence. It became the law. Britain in the 70s and the early 80s was becoming increasingly known for its violent gangs of youths, both on the football terraces and the streets. The Soul Boys gave their gangs names like the Riot Squad, the Soul Patrol and the Brixton Frontline, but despite their aggressive sounding nicknames, the Soul Boy scene was the first youth culture where there was no known associated violence. The interesting thing about the way the whole soul scene developed was that, of course, we know about Chris Hill, we know about his uh, events that he used to run and uh, Loads of people used to go to them. It, it was a pilgrimage, a genuine pilgrimage for a lot of people, but of course they had their own venues to go to as well. There were their own DJs. There's lots of other people who were out there pioneering the music and they're still there now doing that thing. And what they did is they generated their own crowds as well. 
we call them crowds, but in those days it became this thing called tribes, which basically meant everybody stamped their own identity of where they came from, what club they started at, what town they may have come from. Everyone got a crazy name. And unlike virtually anything else in the kind of nightclub scene, it was embraced. The idea of actual people coming from different places and actually going to one venue was embraced. Normally speaking, if you went to a discotheque at the time and you came from somewhere else, chances are you get a punch in the face. What you got here was a handshake and a hello and we all have the same records. The tribes were such an important element because I think they helped cement the scene and cement it, spread it as well. I mean, who would have thought you could have names like the Larkfield Loonies, uh, Magnum Force, Dimlows used to be one of my favourites. Uh, and they were girl, girl, uh, it, it was, you know, you would imagine it's probably just a male thing. Far from it. I remember the Crawley Crumpets, uh, who were a real proud band of ladies. And um, I also remember, at, uh, I think it was the Pearly All Day, looking out, and there was this huge banner, because banners were important. Uh, it was very tribal, but friendly tribal. And I remember seeing uh, the Streatham Virgin Eaters, uh, and they did this huge banner, and on it it said, please apply. It, w it was almost like wearing colours, like, you know, like, like you were brought up in the Bronx, you have to wear your colours, you know. And the Brixton Frontline had this um, Peter Tosh album sleeve of the hand on the barbed wire with, with you know, and um, the Black Kidney, they were the sort of fun, you know, tongue-in-cheek. I mean, to name, name your own tribe out of the, to go off, I said, why did you name it the Black Kidney? Oh, because we meet in a pub called the White Arn. There was dozens and dozens and dozens of tribes, but you knew them all. I don't know his name, but he's part of the pre-clones. I don't know his name, but he's one of the privates, you know, it's... Uh... We were the stiffered sex maniacs. Um, not the most original name, in fact, we were about the third sex maniacs, I think, but... Um, we took it, what we thought, to new heights. We, we went a bit out on the T-shirt, spent an extra 30p here and there. And um, we looked the part. I think one of our T-shirts actually said, um, not the original, the best. Um, and just through knowing a few people locally, we grew and grew, and uh, people knew who we were, with banners, all sorts. I particularly remember in the main room at Caster, and looking, around, looking out from the stage, it, would, it was like a mini version of looking around, you know, um, sort of Wembley when England would play, um, or, you know, Lord's Cricket Ground, that you'd see loads of different groups of people with their flags up. It was particularly marking up the Union Jack and stuff like that. Back in the mid-70s, I think everybody knows nowadays what the 70s constituted in terms of, what everyone thinks of, in terms of revival of the 70s, which is big air, big shoes, big trousers, big collars. And the whole point about the Soul Boy scene was it went completely the other way. Um, in terms of being a fella, there was short hair, small collars, there were pointy shoes with not big heels, there were narrow trousers, there were smart jackets. It was completely against the grain of what everybody considered a young man should be dressed as. It was classic clothing, you might say, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and it was reintroduced by the soul boy scene to coincide with the uh, music they were listening to. Fashion was very important. And what I loved about the scene, being just about the most unfashionable person I've ever met, a complete fashion dumbo, uh, was that everybody was so creative, but creative for themselves. And you'd look out, I mean, I've looked out three, four, five thousand people, everybody is their own fashion shop so individual. I used to find that really exciting. Uh, there used to be a few sort of uniting things. The jazzers used to like their berries um, and their scarves. Uh, and of course, then you had the tribal thing where they all had their own silly T-shirts with uh, wonderful slogans on them. So, uh, uh, so there was that sort of thing. But it was a very individual thing. You see anything from, you know, a girl in an S&M outfit uh, with a boy dressed up as a city gent. It was quite extraordinary uh, and, of course, added to the scene because it was so much fun. Both uh, Robbie and Chris Hill were, were very influential. I mean, I, I was sort of, you know, early teens trying to decide what I wanted to do. You know, I knew something, I had to do something to do with music and I tried to play the guitar and the piano and ended up playing the drums badly in a terrible Black Sabbath covers band and um, got into DJing. And 
started to get, I don't know, I was just, I was just immediately fascinated by the radio. So I would sit and listen to Robbie's show um, and tape his show and write down the records that he played and then phone people up and trying to get hold of them. So, and he, he was, you know, this, the, the, he ran, he was like, you know, one, he ran one half of our world. You know, he was the, the voice on the radio. He would report on what was happening at the weekend. As a, a, a live DJ, I was fairly unusual. Well, they didn't used to think I was alive. They said I was dead. But, I mean, I felt I was alive. And I was quite late playing records in a live situation. I was on radio first and then did that. Uh, and people like Froggy had been playing uh, music and mixing for ages. And I, I did my first gig with him, and he, he was mega helpful and a really good mixer as well. And on the other hand, Chris Hill was just the first... Well, not only did he have an incredible passion and for the music and, and great taste in terms of the records he played, but he was a phenomenon as a performer. I mean, it just no, I'd never seen anything like it. And I, th I, I still think to this day, you know, we haven't really seen many people, although the scene has obviously you know, evolved and changed so much. In terms of performance, um, I've, there's very few people I've come across that was, were as sort of individual, unique as, as he was. I mean, he, he would sing along with the records. It sounded kind of odd now, but, you know, he, he just would, you know, he, it was a proper pop star, really. You know, he had, he had every, everybody in the room in the palm of his hand, you know. The triumph of club nights led to the advent of all dayers, and following their success, the concept was taken one step further with the introduction of the Soul Boy Weekender. Robbie Vincent made the idea a reality by persuading the managers of a holiday camp at Caister in Norfolk to put on the first of what has since become a yearly event. It was on the April Bank holiday in 1979 that over 3,000 Soul fans turned up to the first Caister Weekender, and even today, the event is still going strong. And you've still got two more days to go. I mean, isn't it fucking wonderful? The weekenders were something that um, were to be missed at your peril. You, you couldn't miss a case, though, literally. I mean, I was actually out of work for um, a few months. You know, I've got parents, I can borrow money with the best of them. No way were you going to miss Caister. Case is a strange word because Caister is this crappy little town in Norfolk, which it isn't even Great Yarmouth. And Great Yarmouth isn't much to shout about anyway, but there it is, that's what it was, and it had um, a holiday camp which was available for rent for a weekend, and someone decided for some reason or other uh, what would be a good idea would be to take it over for a weekend and introduce all of the DJs who do all of this hard work in the various clubs around fundamentally the home counties and bring their crowds along and fill it up and provide music for the entire weekend. I'm sure at the time it would have seemed to be a gamble, but in reality it was an absolute jackpot because everybody showed up. There were thousands of people there. Um, every DJ was there. Every face you've ever seen anywhere and wherever you travelled around was there. Everyone's represented in their own corner because the whole tribe thing really came to the fore in terms of the weekenders. And it was the genuine family moment. It's the, it's the word that Chris Hill uses. It's the word that Chris Hill has always used. Uh, he regards everybody as the family, and that's when the family was born. Caster, a lot of people forget, uh, and I like to now. I didn't at the time, but I do like to put on record. It was my idea. I did a gig. It was either for 1830s or the Farmer's Monthly or something. And it was a gathering of people with something in common, either 1830s or farmers, I can't remember which. And I thought to myself, well, I think our scene is now ripe to put all the clubs together, your barn in Digcot, uh, the Lacey Lady, all the other clubs. I thought it's time to bring them together and we'll have a weekend together. And I took the idea to the team at the Royalty in Southgate and they said, yes, we think it's a good idea. And it developed from there. Um, the first one was probably a 1,000. It got out of control when they were 5,000, so we cut it back to 2,000. They're the sort of figures that you're talking about. But it snowballed, it snowballed. That era was fresh. There was a lot of different new things happening. Um, this was before the era of sort of sampling and the big production sort of thing and the, the remix and stuff. You had to go into a studio and you had to deliver what you had at the, right at that time. I do miss that, I do miss that. I don't think that uh, it's never gonna come back. And so with it, you're never gonna get the sort of like that freshness or innocence in music again. I mean, that's gone forever. 
I think um, some of the kids will discover how great soul music is if they are given a chance. Maybe as they grow older, they hear other things, they hear other radio stations that are actually playing it, and they think, this is kind of interesting. Maybe they delve through their parents' record collection or their brothers' and sisters' collection and find things. So it will happen in certain cases. I'm not sure it'll ever be quite the same as it was in what I would call the golden days, but I think there'll always be an element of love of soul music, only for the fact that soul music is so long-lasting. And unlike so many uh, strands of music which are here today, gone tomorrow, I think a lot of these records, a heck of a lot of these records, have lasted the course and will still last. And in the right places, you know, people will still be dancing to um, some of these great tunes sort of 20 years on, possibly. I mean, we still get fanzines from people who were sort of like come up in that area. They were dedicated to the way they used to dress, the way they sort of like, the way they sort of like uh, carry themselves, the way they danced, you know? Uh, it was a magic scene. It was a magic, it was quite magic, actually. The real end of the soul scene for me was walking into Shun. I mean, I can absolutely vividly remember that night. And walking, I mean, I remember walking into Shum in whatever that would have been, 86 or whatever it is, as someone who had still, through their heart, been a soul boy all the way through. I walked into Shum in a Gautier suit, having come from the WAG club. I'd gone from the WAG to Shum, crossed the river, and suddenly here was all these slum boys on E in, in baggy lilac clothes, dancing to music that was, sounded like it was made by metronomes. And I just remember thinking, that's it for me. <laughs> Soul and jazz funk didn't appeal to everyone, and by 1979, a new generation of teenagers had become bored with the punk explosion and were searching around for a new approach. Up stepped Paul Weller and his group The Jam to provide it. The mod revival was upon us. Yeah. 